Stephen D. Houston grew up in the Cumberland Valley, north, or I'm sorry, southwest uh, of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Went to Carlisle High School then Penn, uh, spent some time at Edinburgh, then went to Yale, where he was privileged to work with uh, people such as Michael Coe, Marilyn Miller, and uh, curate uh, material at the Peabody. He then uh, came to BYU. He was the Jesse Knight University professor here at BYU while he was on the anthropology faculty. He currently is the DePe a professor of social science and the chair of the Department of Anthropology at Brown University. And just last year, he was named uh, to the Kislak chair at the Library of Congress. This man is a Guggenheim Fellow. He's a MacArthur Fellow, along with David Stewart and Heather Hurst. He's also received the Order of the Quetzal from the President of Guatemala. And I understand last night at the fireside that you were wearing the, the uh, uh, Quetzal. Oh, there it is right there. So uh, the pin you'll notice on uh, John's lapel is the Order of the Quetzal uh, from the president of Guatemala. Uh, I happened uh, to be with one of his colleagues at Brown, Andrew Shearer, a few uh, weeks ago, who has nothing but high praise for this man. And earlier this year, I was with Ed, uh, Edwin Roman down in Antigua, Guatemala, uh, and they have been uh, co-directors of uh, work at uh, El Sotz. And again, nothing but the most profound adulation for, ha for the, the, the privilege you've been able to work with Stephen Houston. How good is this guy? Well, uh, his dissertation at uh, Yale was on the inscriptions and the monumental uh, architecture at Dos Pilas. He's worked at Piedras Negras, Caminal Huyu, Bonampak, El Sotz, and currently he is on what might be the most exciting uh, excavation all of the Maya world, uh, La Cuernavilla with Tom uh, uh, Garrison. And I've got to tell you a story. <clears throat> John Clark said at the SAA, meet, SAA meetings uh, in Albuquerque that Takishi Inamata's uh, project at Agua de Phoenix is the most important site that uh, has been discovered in John's lifetime. And I was with Takishi 10 days ago, and I said, is this true? <laughs> is, is your site the most important site in all of Mesoamerica? And Takeshi just smiled with his Japanese uh, uh, demure, and he said, you got to go take a look at what uh, Houston is doing down at La Cuernavilla. <laughs> You're in for a treat uh, here today. Um, one of uh, uh, the uh, finest accolades that could come is the fact that Michael Coe chose this man to be his co-author on the ninth edition of the Maya. That's, that's the stature of the, the, the presenter that we're gonna hear today. He's authored dozens of articles, dozens of books. One of my very favorites of all time was The Fiery Pool, uh, The Maya and the Mythic Sea, done with uh, Daniel Finmore. I thought that was a tremendous uh, paradigm shifting uh, uh, a study. And then I absolutely adore the blog, Maya Decipherment that uh, Stephen Houston writes along with David Stewart. This is tremendous, cutting edge stuff, and also written with a little bit of panache and elan. And um, he, uh, in the current article about sn uh, Snake on a Stick, he quotes our very own Kerry Hull, our very own John Robertson. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen Houston. Uh, you're a brilliant uh, scholar. But this is the most important thing about him. He's married to Nancy, they have two children, and they uh, belong to the, society, the Religious Society of Friends, also known as the Quakers. Stephen Houston. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the uh, astonishments of being back here is also constantly asking myself, why did we ever leave? We have such friends here. I have such admired colleagues. Uh, we had an extraordinary reservoir of resources, and we have the mountains. Um, but above all, we have all of you here, and, and I'm so delighted to see you. Now, when I was uh, tapped to come to BYU uh, at this point quite a few years ago, more than I would like to admit, I have to say that uh, it was to my greatest benefit to be able to be here among you and to be able to uh, move forward with my scholarship in ways that I had not thought possible. We have some of the strongest minds here in my subject, and we still do as well. Now, this is a, a topic tonight which is one that's going to take us very far from this 
rather desert-like environment, albeit sometimes threaded with uh, beautiful rivers and the like and snow-capped peaks, we're going to be going into a world that is uh, forever changing. And how is it changing? It's changing because in this image that you see before you, there is uh, obviously a, a jungle in the background, and you can see it's being absolutely denuded. And as I, I think back on the long and distinguished career of John Sorensen in particular, I have to reflect on, and it's my great honor to be here to, to, in, in, to give this uh, a talk on his behalf, we have to reflect on how much the world has changed since John became interested in this area, presumably in the 40s and 50s and beyond. Because this is the current reality in which the forest is disappearing. And in fact, if we look at this next image, this is the daily reality that many of us encounter in the areas that we so love, namely in northern Guatemala and in other places within the Maya heartland. This is a satellite image, uh, composed, of course, from multiple images of the kinds of fires which are also denuding this landscape. They take place on a yearly basis. They're from agriculturalists who are preparing their lands. But as in many parts of the world, such as, for instance, California today, the fires get out of control. And they are also effecting this enormous assault on this tropical paradise that many of us so love. And so I'm going to take you to that paradise, and we're going to go into the deepest jungle, such as you see here, a world that I experience uh, every other couple of months when I'm able to uh, return to Guatemala to do my research. This is, of course, a very learned audience. Many of you know quite a bit about the material I'm going to be speaking uh, about, particularly John. Uh, but it is also a world that is at the center of a civilization that we call lowland Maya civilization. We don't know what the Maya called this, uh, they, we don't even know what they called themselves. But we do understand from a, a many decades of research that one of their most literate phases of existence in which they generated many, many hieroglyphic texts that I've been involved in deciphering flourished approximately during most of the first millennium AD. And I'm now also going to take you even more microscopically, you might say, to that little red blotch, that little red circle in the image before you, which is the center of northern Guatemala. And there is a city that many of you have been to. I've gone there with my dear friends, the Reinhardts, in their, their chopper expeditions. They were enormous fun. And there is what you would see today, even today of the jungle as it still exists, as it existed from almost 12 to 1300 years after the collapse of this city and of its dynasty. Now, let's contemplate the problem of vision, the problem of seeing, the problem of what we do as archaeologists to visualize the past and to see the data that are there for us to scrutinize. As again, John has done in such an erudite way during the course of his life. This visibility is hard won. And I'm going to take you a few decades before my own advent on the scene to show you what archaeological mapping used to be. And here you have three befuddled-looking archaeologists. Actually, they're very capable ones. The tallest one in the middle, clutching his Marlboro Man uh, look and his Marlboro cigarette, is actually Michael Coe's uh, brother. My, Michael Coe is my dear mentor. They're using this primitive device, now exceedingly primitive, to map the ancient city of Tikal. What was the point of this? The point was to dig some of the pyramids there and to be able to fix in space where precisely they might have been located. And here you can see some mapping taking place with someone with a stadia rod. I used to lug these through the jungle. Uh, it's an, a really effective way to lose weight, let me tell you. And this is the result of months of the kind of effort that was done in the case of Tikal from the mid-50s on. Now, this is a remarkably accurate map for what was being done at the time, uh, acknowledging the limitations of the technology of the time, and it is something that I also engaged in in my intrepid youth. I tended to go to some of the most uh, difficult places to work at in the time, surrounded by guerrilla encampments, uh, snakes everywhere. In fact, I call mapping not a search for ruins, but the systematic search for vipers, which I would do on a daily basis. Now, when I was effecting my doctoral work at Yale back in the 1980s, 
this is what we would do. We set up a camp in the middle of nowhere. Most of this jungle is now gone, I regret to tell you. We'd have to sort out logistics. And I can also affirm to you that most of the important lessons we uh, uh, should have as archaeologists are never taught in graduate school. We're not taught how to manage labor. We're not taught how to manage mules. We're not taught how to acquire the food that we brought in. Now, what was that mapping like in an earlier stage of my life? Well, first of all, there's the jungle. And so how do you deal with that? Well, you start cutting sight lines so that you can start looking through there with your various telescopic devices. Now, this is also our improvised attempt often in vain, to remove all of the mosquitoes in the vicinity. And I would uh, try expedients like stuffing termite nests into perforated canisters of, uh, of uh, powdered milk, and these were totally ineffective. Eventually, I discovered you had to wear double or triple sets of clothing and other weight reduction uh, strategy of, of, of singular benefit to me. So and occasionally, you would not only have those sight lines, but you would also be able to strip off some of the vegetation. And here I am with my uh, trusty worker at the time. We've cleared off an area, and it is prefiguring for you right now some of the topics we'll be talking, discussing later today. Because what this gentleman is standing on after this clearance, and it is impossibly thick vegetation, you can barely get through it without all the machete activity, are walls. These tell us immediately that there is a need on the part of the local Maya to defend the centers of their cities. Okay, so we've done all that mapping. Then what we do is we created at that time these often exquisite handcrafted productions, which would be maps, we'd have to calculate by hand, we would plot it out, and then we would draw. In this area, you can see we've paid special attention to the mosquito netting. Now, this is what came of it. This is what I worked on when I was finishing my dissertation in a remote cabin in the New Hampshire woods, courtesy of my in-laws and Nancy looking after us all. And you can see here, believe it or not, a I think a fairly coherent idea of what was under that jungle. There are the walls, there are stela, these are the monoliths that had their inscriptions on them, fallen, you can see the pyramids, and everything is hopefully fixed in time and in space as well as we can do. So those are my youthful fumblings, you might say. All of this has now changed, and I would, uh, again, uh, indicate to you in, in the boldest possible language that there are very few times in Maya archaeology or indeed in archaeology in general in which there are game-changing technologies. One had to do with the beginnings of radiocarbon dating. Another has now taken place and that is the employment of a kind of technology that allows us to see through the jungle and see through extant jungle, not just the jungle that's been burned off and uh, destroyed by settlers and by um, uh, drug runners and the like. This novel perception is one that I think it's useful to contemplate or to understand in terms of art. Now, all of us, uh, I imagine, are uh, uh, great aficionados of art. We like to see a painting. There are some wonderful ones out in the, the foyer here. And all of us also know that some of the greatest art was produced by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. Now here's the prophet Daniel. It's painted from about uh, 1508 to 1512 by that arduous process that we know he used. That's what it looked like prior to the cleaning. And suddenly we have a different colorized world as a Turner movie magic has been taken place here. And we're seeing the ceiling that was left uh, by Michelangelo in all of its glowing, luminous color. It's been brought back to life to some extent time has been evaporated for us. Now there are some controversies about that particular cleaning operation, but I'll take you to another. Now this is uh, by a Flemish artist. It's uh, also in Rome, and it was placed fairly close to what was thought at the time to be the, the holy steps by which the, the Savior eventually ascended up in his uh, uh, time of judgment uh, to meet with Pontius Pilate. This is what it looked like before the Getty Conservation Institute, bless them, decided to clean it. And suddenly you've got an image in which people emerge. There are temples in the background, and our ability to understand what that artist was trying to do or what the popes or cardinals were trying to accomplish by commissioning this work has suddenly been brought to us in a fresh perspective. Another analogy that I find useful is astronomy. 
That is, many of us have looked up at the stars. If we have a sufficiently powerful telescope, we'll may, maybe be able to make out the planets and rings of Saturn. And if we manage to get to Palomar, Mount Palomar, other locations, we will see yet more. Now, this is an example of it, and it's a GIF, which is showing the New Horizons spaceship approaching Pluto. Notice how our perception changes. And what you're going from is that blob earlier on. And as the spaceship gets closer and closer, the visibility has become clarified and enhanced to an extent that was simply impossible before. This is what LIDAR does for us. It has brought us our New horizon spaceship. It has brought us the conservation magic of the Getty in a sense, but applied to these obscured jungle landscapes. Now, what is LIDAR? It is a combination of, according to some people, light and radar, at least uh, it has originally been conceived of by means of an acronym, light detection and ranging. Now, what is that in, in, uh, in actuality? What it is, is the process by which we use a, an incredibly expensive device. Uh, there aren't many in, within easy range of archeologists, believe me. And that device is mounted in a small plane or it is mounted at, as in a case I'll talk to you about in a second or so, on a chopper. The best situations are ones in which you get up on a repeated basis, and what is it you're trying to do? Well, let me run you through this process. I'm gonna lead you by the hand. You have to have first a fixed reference point down on the ground. And this is basically being triangulated with the device that's flying up there in the chopper or in the plane. And so you have a sense in, of what the absolute elevation is between the two. Okay, let's introduce the LiDAR magic, and in particular, the Optech Titan, which we've been using more recently. This is a device that shoots out at three different angles, and in addition to that, it is recording other sorts of information, some of it multispectral. It's not just about the visible, but in other spectra as well. When these are eventually uh, brought together, when we have this device being flown, shooting billions of laser pulses down to the surface, we try to fly in this manner to be as systematic as possible. We go back and forth a little bit the way, let's say a biblical ox would be used in plowing, going back and forth and back and forth. And what's happening as a result of that process is those innumerable measurements, those emissions of laser that are being shot down mostly will hit the vegetation. But because there are so many of them being emitted, a few will hit the ground. That measurement, beyond which there's no possibility of a measurement because it's hit a flat surface, we do all sorts of algorithmic magic, which allows us, in a sense, to strip away the, ma the, the, the vegetation, the obscuring jungle. Now, this is what a LIDAR, LIDAR segment would look like, if you're able to just do it on a linear fashion. Notice the red blotches above. Those are the ones that are going to be hit most often by this device that's flying up above. Then you can see, probably, that fewer pulses are reaching lower levels of the canopy. And eventually, in that darkest blue, that lapis lazuli color, it's meeting the Earth. That's what interests you. And by means of figuring out how these things might articulate, we can be left with this kind of view of a completely jungle-girded landscape. Now, if you will, I had shown for you that linear segment going right across a set of trees, and that is indicated here by a red line. But that doesn't interest us. We don't just want lines. We want three-dimensional landscapes. And this is a multi-directional vision, which allows us to look not only under a single, almost infinitesimally narrow band of LIDAR emissions, but these areas underneath. And what I've done deliberately here is to juxtapose the jungle up above, what you would see maybe flying over it in a plane, and what is now visible down below. Now, LIDAR is the revolution that is now, I would say, not just convulsing, but it is proving to be a profound gift to the advancement of science. It's been used in a number of other places, and as usual, a lot of Mesoamerican specialists, such as I am, we're always late to the game, we're always picking up technology last. Where else have they applied this? It's been used, for instance, in going over the sacred, the holy site of Tara, in Ireland, as some of you might have visited, in which every last modulation of the surface is now visible. 
Now, this is not such an issue with Ireland, where you obviously don't have a tremendous amount of tree cover, but suddenly you're getting highly accurate information of a three-dimensional sort that does not involve that arduous mapping that I described from my youth. But the most, I would say, breathtaking project is one that's now being enacted on a continual, ongoing basis, and that's the key, all over much of northern Cambodia. Now, you're looking at an image over a good chunk of that country. There are these red quadrangles and little lines. Those are the most recent, what we call, LIDAR captures over places like Angkor Wat. Some of you have probably visited these locations. And just to give you a sense of what is possible here, you might have noticed just last week in the New York Times and in widespread coverage, from the international press, that they're discovering entirely new cities, uh, including probably the progenitor of um, Angkor Wat itself. Now, the person responsible there, and there's always a point man, uh, there's usually a group of people, but there's also a leader, is Damien Evans, who is now, in fact, working in the local regional capital. This is what LIDAR has popped up. Think of the jungle that would cover a tropical civilization not that dissimilar from the Maya. All of that has been stripped away, and in a manner that would have been impossible even with a thousand years of mapping, you are seeing every last modulation of that surface. And the point that needs to be made is it's not answering questions only, it is supplying further questions. It's probing into new directions that will supply scholarship with many, many doctoral dissertations to come. To give you one example, I'm gonna highlight here a small rectangle, which happens to be outlined for you in yellow. These almost maze-like elements, uh, it looks like the inside of a Christian cathedral almost, although I doubt it's connected, are features that we did not notice before, are features that we have no inkling of what their function might be. And this is the truth of LIDAR. I've spent decades going into the jungle to do mapping, and I have walked by and on features that are notably obvious with this technology that are entirely invisible to the eye. So it's extending our ability to sense the past. Now, those are exemplary, uh, I would say, models of how LIDAR can function in terms of heritage management. There were attempts to, and were successful, unfortunately, to drive a highway right through Terra, which wouldn't seem like the smartest idea, but it was done by the Irish authorities. And then we have this example of ongoing research over most of northern Guatemala, showing that that is the largest city in the ancient world, bar none. Now, the technology has come to us in the Maya, and it came relatively late. It's only been with us for approximately 10 years, I would say. And I began on a project where I also worked as a young man in Caracol. I was one of the first teams to go in there. Nancy went out on the very first expedition. It was somewhat horrific, as all expeditions tend to be. They're full of adventure, and they're full of misery in equal measure. Now, this is the city of Caracol, again, covered with jungle, but if you look very carefully, it's a little hard to make out, you'll see little corrugations or lines, and that is a landscape of intensive agriculture that would have sustained this population in the hundreds of thousands. Now, I'm going to tell you about what I'm involved in, which is obviously in the Maya area, and it's building upon these illustrious models that I've just described for you. And it's part of an initiative that is being funded by many local Guatemalans of, of, uh, of some prosperity. And in, in their vision, they've been able to uh, get us off the ground into the air to be able to undertake LIDAR over large expanses of the center of ancient Maya civilization. And what you're seeing here with this initiative by Pakunam uh, in uh, Guatemala are the areas we've flown. And I can report right now that as of a few months ago, and not many people know this, we've probably quadrupled the amount of land that's now been captured by LIDAR. It's undergoing processing, which is a highly technical process that, frankly, I don't really understand. Because that's the point. All archaeology is collaborative. The lone... Uh, a fedora-clad Indiana Jones figure going off to loot a golden idol. These figures don't exist or shouldn't. But rather, we're engaged in a collaborative work in which all of us function together the way I would say BYU does or the LDS community in, 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 in general. This is how things are done. It's not by individuals. It's by people working together. The key figures here would be Marianne Hernandez, who is the head of Pacunam, 
There's Marcello Canuto at Tulane, Francisco Estrada Belli, who was connected with Tulane as well, and above all, my buddy Tom Garrison, who was a postdoc of mine at Brown University and is now at Ithaca College. And this is the kind of numbers of people involved, and believe it or not, I am there in the background, by far the oldest, uh, but not perhaps uh, the least excited. I'm now going to give you a sense of the exhilaration of looking at LIDAR for the first time. And this is one of those jungle-clad views that I've been describing to you of this landscape, and you just can't believe there's anything under those jungles but parrots and snakes and monkeys and a lot of ticks. Uh, and, and you'll see there are clouds as well that are obscuring. Now, what I've done here is exactly to scale, shown you what is visible today should you be able to fly over, and then what LIDAR reveals. And it is a comprehensive vision that is simply incredible. That is, when no archaeologist I know has viewed these for the first time and not had unwillingly tears rush to the eyes because it just takes you to a new dimension of spatial understanding and of possibility. Now, how has LIDAR led to a series of developments? What has it told us by way of market advances? I'll go through a couple of them. There are many, many of them that can be uh, surmised or extracted. But the first is quite simply that arresting vision, these new vistas of how to see a landscape all at once. And think of it before the maps were simply of points and lines that you had achingly and, and with great struggle been able to piece together. These are now three-dimensional, connected <laughs> landscapes that reveal, above all, relationships. It's all about this. Now, LIDAR also allows you, with these new arresting vistas, to manipulate all of those data. And believe me, they just float in a computer. They're not necessarily uh, there in any physical existence unless you print them out. And you can use a variety of filters, which have been designed by specialists in this technology, to come up with very different views. Now, some of these are going to look psychedelic. They're going to look like some poster from 1960s Hate ashbury But what they're doing is giving you a slightly different view of the same thing. And that's the purpose of scholarship above all. This is the same mound group as accessed by LIDAR. And this is my favorite, particularly lurid. I should equip you with black light glasses. And what it's giving you is a different feeling of that surface, a different feeling of the relationships. And there are endless interrogations, therefore, that can take place of these data that float in the billion and the computers that are required to process these data. So new points of view. The next thing I would say, and this is breathtaking, is the number of people out there. And we had had no inkling before this massive Pakunam survey, of which I've been privileged to be part of, uh, uh, allowed us to see things for, in a new way. And so there at Tikal, there in the lower, uh, more or less, right-hand side of this image, you'll see that little blotch, that little hot spot. That's because there's a large, high density of buildings that were there. Now, there's no doubt if we look at these little vignettes that have been captured by LIDAR across this heartland of the Maya, you'll see that there are extraordinary numbers of buildings clustered around Tikal in north and going over to the east and west. But notice also an other benefit of the LIDAR, which is tells you where the silences are, where the empty spaces might be. And the sense of pulsing and of concentration is also giving us an entirely new view of how people lived on this landscape. This is uh, almost a nighttime view. I was joking to a friend yesterday, maybe it was Jack. Uh, the dark areas are probably, that, think of that as North Korea uh, without the electricity. And then all of those other areas, with all of those little white dots, each one of those represents a mound. It represents a ruin that we can now see with 100% certainty with the LIDAR. And there's this feeling of great density as you move closer to the east and closer to Tikal. Now, that's a big picture. That's the macro region. That's us coming in on the New Horizon spaceship. There are also new data, there's new evidence that are at the local level. And this is where all archaeology takes place. Ultimately, as in politics, politics are local, archaeology is local. And again, to give you an idea of the abundance of new information, I'm going to contrast here one of these LIDAR captures near Tikal with every last mound group. In other words, there are no longer any, or will not be, any 
lost cities. There will not be a single mound, a single building that will not be visible to an archaeologist. And this takes us to an entirely new dimension of possibility. Now, let's go even further in. Let's zero in on Tikal itself, which I'd displayed to you with that image before. That's downtown Tikal. Very few people have seen this image, and it has all of that broken landscape. And right in the middle on this defensive area is Tikal itself. Every last mound Every last ruin is now accounted for with all of these white dots. It means that we now know what the limits of these settlements are. In some ways, we see settlements as grading into one another and overall with a population that is, we are thinking is exceeding in well into the millions. Another thing to remember about LIDAR is what it tells us that we just can't figure out and a sense of enthralling puzzlement that really drives me into this kind of research and my colleagues. There are so many enigmas, there are features that we simply do not understand that need to be accounted for by getting the boots on the ground. This is in an area north of Tikal, and the yellow dashed line is the old mapping site line that I was describing before. In Spanish and in Guatemalan uh, parlance, we call it the brecha. It's always straight, use a compass line, you map off of it. But notice these features to the side which had never been noted by archaeologists before. It's peculiar roads, alignments, strange large enclosures. Each one of these potentially represents a dissertation topic for a bright and ambitious and hardy grad student. Now, the other reality of the Maya, regrettably, is that the objects that come from their buildings and from their tombs have value on the art market. It's diminishing somewhat as international regulations are beginning to be enforced, but the fact of the matter is I have never visited a ruin, no matter how small, which is not absolutely Swiss cheesed with looters pits. This is a plague of looting. It's resulted in all sorts of pots and pieces of jade that find their way out on the art market. Often we have no idea where they came from. What LIDAR allows us to do is to figure out exactly how much looting took place, where we would indeed go into looters' pits potentially to find some of the things that the looters discovered. That some of the most important discoveries, in fact, the last couple of decades, such as the San Bartolo, funded by my dear friends the Reinhardts, are, were first discovered by going in the looters' tunnels. And this allows us to plan, to project, to take charge of this activity in a way that's going to be intellectually ambitious and is going to be prosecuted in a way that's going to lead to great things. Now, the final thing I'm going to talk about, and this is particularly of interest, I hope, to John, is the matter of defense. The matter of warfare, the matter of conflict, which is regrettably, and I say this as a friend or as a Quaker, regrettably a part of human nature. This is why we have to strive against it. And the LIDAR capture that, again, refers to these enormous, voluminous quantities of information that have been brought together, tell us where the Maya had their fortifications. What is a fortification? Well, it's an embankment. It could be a series of ditches. It could be a moat. There are all sorts of different types of defensive fortification. And this is what we've discovered, that in the areas where the most people live, not surprisingly, we're seeing through the LIDAR entirely unsuspected fortification systems. And these are most intense around the city of Tikal. Again, that hot spot. If you can make out the red from the back of the audience, you'll see that this is an area that I will then be returning to, I hope, in just a few minutes ago from now. Before getting into warfare, though, I want to talk about the nature of Maya conflict. And uh, it's informed by my study of hieroglyphic writing. And one of the things I've been very fortunate to be able to do is to be directly involved in the decipherment of Maya writing. And it was a, a great and continuing interest in my part of being able to read what they're saying to us, to hear, if you will, the voices they left behind engraved in stone. Now, this is one of the most extraordinary images of violent conflict of bodies roiling in space that comes from a building that I've studied with Mary Miller and Heather Hurst at the city of Bonampak. It's almost a virtual reality before uh, Silicon Valley got involved in these kinds of technologies. You walk into this room and you can almost hear the noise, the cries, the screams of vanquished uh, vanquish captives, but also people who are glorying in their victory. 
Now, you'll also notice this little white spots and those rectangles and, and uh, quadrants around these images of warriors who are in active conflict. They each have hieroglyphic texts, and many of them happen to be legible. These data, this evidence, is something that helps me now to tell you a little bit about what we know about Maya warfare. Now, let's get into the nitty-gritty level. I mentioned that every thing is local in some ways. Every act of violence ultimately is visited on this or that human body. That is, that's the basic of uh, uh, sad reality of violence. And the first thing to say about the Maya is, at least in their art, as a cultural principle, I would say, they viewed themselves, at least among the elites, as warriors. They're people that fought each other in this nitty gritty, direct fashion, warrior on warrior. And when we have that kind of conflict, there are winners and there are losers. And I would almost describe part of their cultural concern is with head hunting. And here is a pot that shows an inverted stuffed head that's on the back of a captive. And presumably that captive himself had taken this person in uh, uh, his own direct conflict in the past. So it's very intimate, it's very personal, it's very hands-on. And it involves also using those people for sacrificial offerings. Now this is a bowl that's at the Museum of Fine Arts up in Boston, and it has a series of warriors doing a post-war dance. They're playing their drums, they're playing their flutes. And if you look over to the side, you can see the sorry residue of those conflicts, which is a brutalized, bloodied captive. And there isn't exactly a sense of, you might say, Christian charity present among these images. It's about reducing almost the humanity of your captive, of making them lower than the low, and they're often depicted being trod upon by their victors. So this is brutal, and it's not attractive, and it's hard to explain. And yet it's combined with an exquisite art, with a highly literate civilization, which would almost seem paradoxical. How can you have beauty and pain so close together? And they're even beginning to butcher these captives, as you can see here. Now, the imagery is not only the picture that we're looking at. We're also fascinated, at least I am, by the hieroglyphic texts that we've been able to sort out in a lot of their uh, detail, their granular detail. These are all a set of hieroglyphs which we can read in every last um, uh, element, which tell us about how the Maya described the acts that resulted in what we just saw. Look how personal it is. This person is grabbed, they're seized. Again, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of mano a mano conflict, you might say. And it's a long-term relationship where they're interested in who the captor might be. They're interested in weaponry, who has a shield, who has a flint. How many captives have you taken? One person will glory in the fact and boast that they have taken seven captives, another 21. It never seems to get above 21 for some reason. So these are the glyphs and the events and attested directly in hieroglyphs that are about that direct contact I mentioned before. But we're interested in broader conflicts because how else are we going to explain those fortifications that I'll be telling you about in just a short few minutes? Well, we know that they saw these broader conflicts in terms almost of natural events. We can talk about a hurricane of activity in, in our own kind of slang. Well, they saw war in terms, in terms of storms, of, of almost natural events that are resulting in this copious release of almost a deluge of water. And this is the glyph that describes that in particular. It's got various proposed decipherments. I've got my own ideas, but it basically means to uh, engage in a high-level conflict. And there are consequences to this. You force people to leave their kingdoms. You force them to go up into exile. And eventually, if things work out for them, they're able to return back to hearth and home. This is an example of what happens if you're defeated. Well, you drop your weapons, and then your body doesn't belong to you anymore. It belongs in all of that horrific kind of imagery we saw before. And the impacts must have been strong, not only with those, by taking this particular prince or that king in conflict of decapitating a kingdom, but you're also going after cities. And this is a close-up of a text that reads, Pulli, meaning something gets burned, it's a change of state, and it's describing a city, a location in which this is taking place. It is all contextualized for you by the fact that there's this warrior standing by this with his shield and with his spear over to the side. 
Now, there's one image I know which is taking us probably into a mythic direction, but is probably also giving us a, a template for historical action among the Maya, and that's attacking a fortress. And keep this image in your mind as we move on towards the end of this presentation. Now, this is a close-up view of the scene. It's one of the very few that shows women being seized. It's almost like, if you understand your classical illusions, the rape of the Sabines, that is, going after enemy kingdoms, seizing women. And there may have been much more of this raiding than we suspected, even going into the earliest colonial period after the Spanish conquest. Now, we see women down below. One has a baby. She's trying to uh, provide it with some reassurance that is surely never going to come because bad things are happening indeed. There's a threatening warrior who's holding up a shield. And then up there to the side, with a stylized image of a Maya hill, there's this gentleman splayed in the somewhat uncomfortable and I would say undignified position, and he's clutching a stone. Now, one of the things we're now discovering in abundance in the archaeology of places where my students are working, and also Tom Garrison and I have to be working, are stones galore, just heaped up. They used to be tossed out by archaeologists. Many of these are sling stones, and this seems to have been an extremely important part of their weaponry. If they get too big, you throw them with your hand. You're going to use anything you can to defend your cities. And so, to summarize, after I hope I haven't confused with this welter of visual and textual information, we have events that are personally momentous. You're taken captive and bad things are going to happen to you. There's no doubt about it. If you take that captive, good things will happen to you. You increase in prestige. And also, we have to believe they're rippling political effects because ultimately, these things mattered. We happened to think in these landscapes that are containing millions of people. So we have a warrior ethos, which almost implies a village. And then we have these conflicts, which imply cities and kingdoms and perhaps empires involved, and they were materially devastating. Terrible things happened to a lot of people. Now, what this implies is that there must have been armies. There must have been infrastructure in place in which we have these token references to people boasting about individual accomplishments, but then increasing evidence of convulsions that are affecting large populations. And this is where I bring you to the tail end of my talk, which is back to the area near Tikal in work that I'm doing with Tom Garrison. And this is in the conflict in that hot zone. I don't mean in the Doug Preston sense of a, some virus that's gotten out of a lab in the outskirts of Washington, D.C. I'm speaking about an area in which we know these events took place. We know that the infrastructure exists. We know this because of the LIDAR. Let's get up close again. Let me take you into the very center of that area near Tikal. And I'm going to take you, in fact, to a valley. Most archaeological sites and most physical features, when the Maya didn't name them, have the most banal, dumb names you can imagine. This is called, it's like a development here. Uh, the Buena Vista Valley. You could sell, you know, uh, suburban homes there, perhaps. But it, it is called that for a good reason, if you know some Spanish. It's, you can see things from a distance if you get up on top of that mountain. Now, we'll talk about that ridge, especially the north side, in just a second or so. But what the LIDAR has done is it's allowing us to date parts of this landscape. And this is this micro-regional aspect we've mentioned before. For instance, the older buildings, which are not built up on top, almost have a kind of melted look to them. And that's because they were subject to these elements of nature that, have, as we all know, hit with special forests with these monsoonal-like rains. And these are from the time of the, what we call the pre-classic. So a few centuries before the time of Christ, going a short time after the time of Christ. Now look at that image nearby. That's from the later period when we have these hieroglyphic records that are legible. Crisp angles, much better defined buildings. And what it means is we have a fair presumption that we can see from the LIDAR what many of these landscapes might date to. And there are a lot of complications here. And eventually, believe me, you've got to get the boots on the ground. Now, here is the area where I work. Here are what we've been able to do from this kind of evaluation of the surface. You'll notice immediately that the later material is mostly up in the hills. That suggests to us they're worried about defense. They don't want to be where they used to live, as indicated here by all those little red dots, in the open areas where they could uh, presumably enjoy the harmonious uh, benefits of peace. Something has happened to this civilization. 
And they give you a density comparison, which is only possible because we can see every last mound out there because of the LIDAR. This is where the early settlements seem to be in an open area. They're settling near the water. This would be great for suburban development. And this is where they move later. Boom, they're going right up into the hillocks and they're beginning to cluster over towards Tikal. So the picture we get here is of an embattled land. Something has happened at this time. And it's not only being recorded in inscriptions, it's being recorded in a sense in the modifications of the landscape. Now this embattled landscape is one I've been digging in for, gosh, at this point, about 14 years. El Zolt's first, and now we're focused on the city of La Cuernavilla. And what we discovered is that this, that when we were first in this area, I would walk to Tikal at least once or twice, uh, a long and, and quite difficult journey. You would look up at those ridges and you'd think, well, archaeologists are lazy, right? We're lazy people. And I would, I would think, ah, well, there's nothing up there. We're not going to spend half a day climbing up just to, to see uh, a featureless landscape with no cultural remains on it. And that turns out to have been completely erroneous because what happens with the LIDAR is we're now seeing probably, I would say, the largest system of fortifications in ancient America leading up towards Tikal. So think no longer of this warrior ethos where you've got this tally, this list of how many captives you want to take. This has now launched us into an entirely new dimension of conflict. Now, Cornavia itself, and we're fortunate to have funds from the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities to do this work, has multiple groups. And think of it as a system of fortifications. Think of it, although it, that story didn't end well, of the Maginot Line that separated Nazi Germany and France, which the French government built all of these fortifications hoping to keep the Nazis out, or at least to slow them down should those panzer tanks begin to assault the French Republic. And instead, we have have something like this among the Maya. We have not just one citadel, not just one castle, if you will, but many of them. Now, some of them have fascinating features. This one, which we're just provisionally calling Group B. Again, archaeologists are both lazy and also we have no imagination, so we go A, B, C. Uh, this one shows you the ditch and rampart systems, which would involve prodigious amounts of labor. This is going right into bedrock and heaping these things up. They're about 20 feet deep. But notice what I have highlighted for you here with the, the little yellow arrow. There's a reservoir. Now, why would you have water up there unless people were concerned about sieges? They were concerned about some sort of assault that was beyond that momentary spasm of violence that would be more in accord with the warrior ethos. They are here at a different level of conflict in which presumably many people are involved and the conflicts are taking place over a long time. We're seeing, for the first time, moats. We're seeing causeways. We're seeing the ability to manipulate water in ways that will enhance the defense. And even near where I've highlighted the ditch and ramparts are almost garrison-like features, as though these are being laid out by some sort of state mechanism in which they're housing warriors, they're making sure that everything's laid out. And it is of the greatest urgency for us to go here and dig as soon as we can. Unfortunately, I have this day job. I'm a professor, but I will get there eventually. Some of these fortifications don't even seem to be finished. What is the story there? What are the narratives that we can extract from this kind of evidence? It's all something that is highly engrossing. Another feature that was wholly unexpected, and, and frankly, unapproachable until we had the LIDAR, was we're discovering many, many watchtowers. That is, isolated hilltop locations. Uh, for those of you who have seen the Lord of the Rings movie, this is how they signal Gondor to come, or the riders of Rohan. And so they might have been lighting bonfires here, but at the least, they were looking over this landscape that I suspect was denuded of plants. And so how do we explain all of this? How do we bring it all together? And this is the final part of my talk, and it will be brief, which is this is all about the local. It's about particular people. It's about a particular time. And from what we can now see, it, the, all of this is happening within three to four generations where they're building these. Now, how do we know that? It's because we've gone into some of those looters tunnels that we've identified with the LIDAR, and we're discovering kinds of architecture that are not Maya. We're looking at buildings that look like a very different place 
for the technical people out there, it's called the Talu Tablero, we're finding evidence of the impact of the imperial heavy footprint of a distant um, city called Teotihuacan, which some of you, I'm sure, have visited uh, on the outskirts of Mexico City. And that's a recent LIDAR of, of Teotihuacan itself. And all of this is suggesting to us that something is happening here on not just a local, regional level, but on a pan-regional level, in the t worldview of the time, stretching over hundreds and hundreds of miles. And that in itself is a breathtaking insight into the level of conflict at this moment. Now, I mentioned, though, it is local. And this means we can personalize it. And we can do so because we have identifiable people whose names are decipherable to those of us who've been looking at it. And here is one person in particular linked with a date that is of, of great importance to all of us, AD 378. There's a particular date in which we know from inscriptions that a foreigner who was called born from fire, it's not exactly a Maya name, nor is it particularly gentle in its residence. You don't think of someone born from fire as meaning anything but uh, hostile intent. And the remarkable thing is the Maya continued talking about this guy much later, and they even depict him on a pot that was created centuries later. They tell us that he's associated with Teotihuacan, and they give us his name, which is Siak Ak. Now, where is he active? We know he's active at Tikal. We know he's in the picture. But what does it have to do for this area a couple of miles over to the west with our, where a Maginot line, our set of, I don't know, Crusader castles has been erected? We know that on a local stela there, this is a, a monolith that has indecipherable inscriptions placed on it, we know that he's mentioned there too. And he's mentioned as the overlord of that local kingdom. And so as scholars have been noticing for some time, the Maya have gone through a process that's exceedingly turbulent in which their entire world has been set upside down. And by way of analogy, think of Rome. Think of its impact as it's going into southern England, as it's moving into areas with its troops, which are so well organized. This is leading probably to the landscape of El Zotz, of La Cuernavia, and of Tikal. And so ultimately, we're dealing with a very troubled period we have personalities involved. We have fresh opportunities for excavation that are only possible from the LIDAR. And we then we have to ask ourselves, what do these things mean? Were the citadels there, this, this incontestably immense set of fortifications, the like of which we had never seen before, there to surveil, to protect against enemy troops? Or are they the footprint of those enemy troops? Are they there for oppressive reasons? Are they there for defense? Are they there for protection? We simply don't know. And to this point, hopefully we can find more excavations. We're not even sure who's fighting over these areas. And so we have these tantalizing glimpses from the archaeology and the epigraphy that is the inscriptions. And there's more, I promise you, to come. So ultimately, what can I tell you? We have seen. We were asking about this word before, galvanic changes, a, a kind of sparking of electricity going on at this time in which society itself is being affected by violence. It is probably being reformed as a result of these incursions from cities far distant and from warriors far better organized than anything that had been seen before. And ultimately what this will lead to is a recovery of a lost world, which John Sorensen himself has been involved in doing so aptly for his decades past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for a wonderful presentation. So, so clear and so many wonderful things, things to think about. We have questions that have been turned in. And Steve, do you want to take a look I, at this one? I, OK. Um, Brandon, this is like a call-in show, isn't it? Brandon <laughs> asks, uh, what percent of the interesting areas covered by LIDAR, what resolution to use do you need? Excellent questions. The resolution is now, it, depending on how many points actually hit the ground, as I understand, about 20 centimeters, which is, isn't very big. 
what that promises is an extraordinary resolution that is, frankly, better than what we could do before with some of the mapping. What percent of the interesting areas covered by LIDAR? Never enough. We are greedy for more LIDAR, and hopefully we're going to get lots and lots more, and I promise that that is happening as we speak. Have the earthworks of Decal, as seen with LIDAR, been published? No, they have not. <laughs> You're looking at one of the first uh, presentations of it. We are working in, on several articles. Now, there are fortifications that were discovered back in the 1960s by uh, an intrepid undergraduate working with the Tikal project, and there have been some attempts to go back and look at those. We have seen so many more of those fortifications. I would see that almost as one of the defenses for the city itself, and then you had this outer line. My gut feeling is that the citadels we're looking at are probably mostly controlled by Tikal. This is put there by a, 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 a a kingdom with considerable power and access to manpower in particular. Okay. Where do you dig next? Where do we dig next? Uh, as of May, if I can get away from being chair, which is, uh, you wouldn't wor wish on your worst enemy, by the way, I have to say that editorially. Um, uh, hopefully I'll get there in May to continue these excavations. We need more dates. We need, we need to dig in some of these possible garrison areas or palaces, and we're just praying, praying with all of our heart and soul that we're going to find some inscriptions, because that would really clarify things quite a bit. Was there single combat between kings? There is some evidence of this in which, um, and, and certainly when they, they show these warrior images, these tableau, it's a very personal thing where one king grabs the other. It's legitimate to ask, as we think of all political statements, are they telling the truth? And uh, it's almost an imponderable because we don't have any independent attestation, but uh, it could have been that the kings are at least taking credit for an important captive. And in some cases, I have no doubt to be seen on the field of battle being active uh, and successful is going to buttress your authority back home. And so, um, yes. Oh, there's another. Did kings fight each other? Yes, they did, constantly, as a matter of fact. What they focus on are not conflicts between armies. We see it once. We see it on the Bonaparte murals. It's always singularized. It's brought into this level of conflict between this king and that lord. How do we get funding in LIDAR in the Yucatan? Well, in the Yucatan, there's a lot of LIDAR being done by Ivan Sprach. There's a lot being done around Chichen by Rafael Cobos. There's a lot being done in, in the Rio Beck area. So actually, it's being done. The, the Mexican, of course, Mexico is a highly sophisticated, developed country, and they have a lot of their own resources for this. In Guatemala, what, what's happened is, um, as the funding, frankly, dries up for North American researchers working abroad, they've stepped up and have kept a lot of these projects going. And in fact, I would say it's a credit to these uh, several dozen uh, people and families that archaeology is still taking place in Guatemala. And uh, it's... Uh, the question, of course, is what sort of funding is available in this country? Every year they cut the budgets for archaeology from the National Science Foundation. And I can report as of two weeks ago, they've cut out almost all archaeology from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And uh, this, write your congressman. I'm not allowed to say that. Didn't, you didn't hear that from me. Uh, so, yeah, but... In the Yucatan, there, there are many publications in Spanish, and Estudios de Cultura Maya, and Mexico. There, it's coming out. And frankly, a lot of our dissemination uh, is coming out, in, as uh, was mentioned in, in my introduction, in blogs. It comes out very quickly. It's not ideal because it has a, it's uncertain it's how stable those platforms are. But uh, was there a question over here, sir? Yes. Yeah, why is 378 and, and the date within that, uh, it's called the 11 ebb date to all Mayanists. Why is it so important? It's because it's so explicit. And this was uh, studied by my, my good buddy and uh, my compadre, actually, uh, Dave Stewart. And he noticed that on one of the stelia Tikal, they say, on this date, it seems that the local king died, the one who had preceded this event. And afterwards, there's this replacement of the dynasty. And it's almost certainly at that time that you see this, um, this tsunami of Teotihuacan material and an influence coming into the city. And so Dave's argument was that there was a, a kind of battle that resulted in this, and you can almost see it building up a few weeks before in cities nearby on the basis of inscriptions. And then 
they seem to also have had a local uh, kings, but were, were under the control of a Teotihuacan emperor who is mentioned in the inscriptions. And one of the things I can also announce here is that the same group of uh, wealthy patrons in Guatemala, bless them, are also funding excavations that are taking place right now. I spoke to them yesterday to our local ward up there in uh, Edgemont, um, in which we're working in uh, the middle of a pyramid that we think looks just like a copy of one of the more important pyramids at Teotihuacan. So they're reproducing their landscape, and we're turning up now incense burners that must have been made at Teotihuacan itself. So I think there are breathtaking developments soon to ensue. Are there some other questions? And uh, uh, How about you there? Yes? Uh -huh. Okay, how do we know how to read Maya glyphs? How do we know how to pronounce them? Uh, we have a Rosetta Stone of sorts, one of the Spanish um, uh, uh, ecclesiastical figures, a bishop, sat down with a literate scribe and he said, give me your alphabet. And what he thought was an alphabet turned out to be a syllabary of the sort we have in Japanese. You've got them in some other writing systems like Linear B and ancient Greece. And later, much later, in the 1950s, a brilliant Soviet scholar named Yuri Knorozov basically went back to that Rosetta Stone and he decided to start applying it to the set of few books that we had, and it just kept hitting the mark in terms of the decipherment. Now, much of what we call decipherment today is we've gone through the low-hanging fruit, but we're also working on this syllable. Why don't we have that syllable? Where that might that be found? But every time you decipher a word or one of these statements, you're also getting, almost in some ways, more of that lost world we're trying to recover. Now, I hope John Robertson is here, but when I was here at BYU, we were working closely on recovering that language. And there is astonishing sophistication in the Maya, Maya's ability to record nuances of sound you simply wouldn't believe. Long vowels, short vowels, glottal stops. Um, it, frankly, it's as effective as our language, a writing system, easily so, in recording these nuances. So it's a great question. Uh, and Farp, or you, sir, how would you? Type in Maya decipherment, and you'll get it. It's on WordPress, and I like it because I've, I've almost no free time, and so I can come up with an idea and distribute it in an afternoon, write it up quickly. It's almost like being a journalist. Yes, sir, you and back. How denuded are the forests currently compared to what they were during <sighs> the classical life? It's, it, look, it's a tragedy, and uh, there are some areas that are being kept more or less intact, but they're under constant assault, uh, and a lot of it is the most sinister kind of assault you can imagine. It's local drug lords who are trying to launder money. They use corrupt officials or judges to acquire illegal title to these lands. They want to see the jungle burned down completely so that they can put cattle there and establish their own uh, 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 spurious uh, claims to that land. So there are huge forces to destroy the land. Was there a question over here as well? Or? Yeah, we the same question. I was wondering if, if the forest, if there were periods of no rain where the roads were built and... Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. They, they denuded their civilization. I, I think most of us are coming around to the idea, though, that it wasn't the deforestation that did them in. It, they were these droughts beyond their control. And they simply couldn't sustain their agriculture. Yes, it's a great question. Did they have classes? Did they have interclass warfare? A, a site I worked at when I was at BYU, uh, Piedras Negras, Guatemala, had evidence where people were hacking to pieces uh, the royal throne and then distributing it. And it was suggested by one scholar, somewhat seriously, that this was a class revolt. Um, we also know now, because of the inscriptions, that they were attacked by another kingdom. So that's that the theory that's not happened. This is the problem with much history, of course, is most of us, most of our ancestors, were not thought worthy of mention. It's just kings, it's noblemen. I've only seen one depiction of a female slave that I think is a slave. And uh, ordinarily, they're just beneath notice. They're not of any, they're not registering on their LiDAR screen, we'll say. Uh, yes, sir. One, one more question, yeah. maybe. So I'm wondering what percentage of these urban areas, urban and very urban areas, are composed of truly impervious surfaces? Impervious surfaces? Um, like rocks or asphalt, as we know today. Asphalt, well, they, of course, they, yeah, they didn't have that. There, there is actually asphalt-like materials used among uh, in Veracruz, in Mexico. But um, impervious surfaces, uh, they, they are 
transforming their landscape. And uh, my good friend Vern Scarborough uh, has shown that they are exquisitely fine-tuning these urban environments to capture water. They're extremely sophisticated with gradients, and they didn't have engineering degrees from BYU, but they were surely effective at it. Okay. All right. Thank you all.